Hi, this is Bruce Rawls. I'm speaking today with Doug Sparks, a longtime teacher of A Course in Miracles and student of uh, Dr. Kenneth Wapnick, uh, another teacher we admire tremendously. And uh, we thought we'd talk today about resistance, which is a, a pretty wide ranging, all encompassing topic. <laughs> so we'll see what we can get done in an hour. So anyway, thanks, thanks Doug, for, for being with me this next hour and I'm looking forward very much to this conversation. Oh, yeah. Um, resistance, uh, as you just implied, creeps into every corner of everyone's work with the course because it works in the background. Uh, most of us as students of this course are simply not uh, aware of the uh, enormity of our resistance to this course. In fact, most of us at the conscious level think we love this course and we love Jesus and, and uh, 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 that is, if we've worked through an enormous amount of resistance to Jesus, uh, which most everyone comes to the course with in one form or another. But our resistance uh, is ongoing. And you know it's ongoing because we keep experiencing ourselves as staying here in the world as a body, uh, separate with its own personality and its own specialness. And so uh, it works in the background. And that'll be what we'll be talking about today is how, how to get it into the foreground without fighting with it. So that sounds great. Now, the, the image that comes to mind is the, the, the I guess it's almost a cliche of the uh, the, the iceberg with 90% of it submerged and we just see the little tip of it. And uh, and so, yeah, bringing it to the surface or, or maybe we need a Holy Spirit submarine to, uh, <laughs> to discover the part that's that's uh, mostly unconscious, something like that. Yes, I, I, I know that when I came to the course, I was very aware of my resistance, uh, primarily to Jesus and God. Um, I came out of a typical Christian background, uh, although uh, church and, and God and Christianity was not rammed down my throat in any kind of way. I just picked it up from the culture, of course. And, and of course, I went to church sometimes. And, and uh, as, a, as a young boy and then a teenager, I knew about the Bible but, and had attempted to look at it, but couldn't understand it. But, but what I did understand uh, growing up in the South was that that uh, all of the people that became their love for Jesus uh, weren't as quite as sincere as they may have appeared to be. They loved Jesus, but they didn't like Black people very much, and some of them didn't like Jews very much. And uh, the, the obvious uh, discrepancy between their professions of loving God and loving Jesus, but having all these unkind feelings about their fellow man set me up to not like Jesus and not like God in the way that I understood them. I, as I came to the Course in Miracles as an adult in my early 30s, I still uh, was looking for anything but Christianity. I was examining Buddhism and all of the New Age stuff that came down the road and uh, was into Alan Watts and, and Ram Dass and uh, had, had read um, uh, Carlos Castaneda's books about a separate reality, looking for something. Uh, then I discovered The Course in Miracles, the year it was published in 1976, but as I began looking at it, I was very aware of my resistance to all of the stuff about uh, God, and when I finally realized, or someone pointed out to me, that Jesus was the author of The Course in Miracles, uh, I was not happy about that at all. So <laughs> I don't remember exactly my reaction, but I probably said something to myself like, oh, Jesus Christ, not him again. You know, because I thought he was the Jesus of the Bible. And, and um, it wasn't until the early 1980s when somebody turned me on to, to Kenneth Wapnick and I started uh, listening to his presentations about the course that I realized that the Jesus of the course and the Jesus of the Bible were two completely different people. Mm -hmm. and, and with that, my resistance began to dissolve somewhat. But uh, of course, it lingered in forms that I was not aware of. Yeah, I, I can I, um, attest to that in a similar vein. I, 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 in the mid '80s, I when I first really, you know, started reading the course, um, I became aware of Ken Wapnick's work, uh, and I bought the, one of the, I guess the first edition of Forgiveness in Jesus. But it wasn't until about about three or four years ago, because of the the, the image on the cover of the book, I finally opened the book and read it. <laughs> I think it was just the resistance to that that uh, that author. That's like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I, I already had kind of dealt with the, you know, the conventional formal religion uh, 
idea that you know there, there's a schizophrenic god it's like that that wasn't working for me either but uh so i that's what i was drawn to a lot of meta like, kind of similar to you a lot of metaphysical uh you know smorgasbord kinds of things and uh, over many years and and finally you know in the mid 80s it's like oh that, that, the course it sounds kind of interesting and then i read it for, for a while and off and on and and um and then it was in 2007 when Gary Renard's uh, book came out. It's like forgiveness, it's all about forgiveness. I got to go back and read that. It's like, and then somehow I missed the idea that that God didn't create the world. It's like, oh, well, that make now it kind of explains everything. I had to go back and reread this in more depth. And then then Ken's work became just kind of the obvious, uh, you know, it, it, light bulb <laughs> opportunity yeah. to to shine yeah. light into the, all the things that I had just kind of sort of like he, he he talks about it the 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 mellows of the music kind of i i read it very much like a you know a, a symphonic or epic poem kind of a thing and, and let the feeling of it kind of wash through me as an inspiration but it really wasn't until i started diving in about 15 years ago more more deeply that i realized oh there's i really need to understand this and more importantly to practice it and and then which kind of leads i guess to today's topic of resistance which is that's the, <laughs> that's the elephant in the room in a lot of ways is is uh keep we all keep bumping into that invisible elephant and keep getting our invisible uh paint out to keep it invisible seems like yeah yeah i have a i have a cute story about the book forgives us in jesus which of course has a large picture of jesus right on the cover of the mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. and um uh my first uh, uh, experience in a group with A Course in Miracles was at Unity Church. And there was a very large group of us, maybe 70 people. Uh, and there was a fellow in my, in my group named Peter Cater. And he had that book, Forgiveness in Jesus. And he was telling us all that uh, he used to go read it in, in a coffee shop uh, in, in downtown Boulder. But he put it in a plain brown wrapper so that no one would see the picture of Jesus on the cover because, of course, we uh, didn't want to be associated with Jesus. And I'm sure a uh, large number of our audience for here will, might uh, resonate with that, that mm -hmm. feeling of, about Jesus at first, that um, uh, he's kind of a secret that uh, we carry around for quite a while before we get comfortable with the idea that he's it's not the historical Jesus that we're being asked to listen to. It's, it's the, the Jesus who is a symbol for the worldly expression of forgiveness, it's the worldly expression of being kind and gentle with everyone and, and working on, on changing your mind about the things that you're resistant to, uh, i.e. this course and, and its message that we have to embrace everyone in order to embrace the world. But uh, I remember I completely identified with uh, this fellow's name was Peter Cater, and he's the one that gave me uh, a tape set of Ken Wapnick's uh, workshop on special relationships. And that was my first experience of Ken. And that was the aha moment for me when I suddenly began to understand the course as I listened to those tapes by Ken. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly, one of the, the earlier, uh, listenings I did with some of Ken's work was the one on form and content and and that with that distinction is just such an important one because the form um that Christianity was um presented in my you know, childhood and adolescence was very different than the content that I read in the course and and I, I like how Ken's work really helps clarify that you know the distinction between uh, you know, form and content, and how, like you say, the, G the Jesus of the Course, uh, Course of Miracles, is has a completely different message than the the formal religious version that we all, that's all many of us grew up with, anyway. So, you know, in in the Course, Jesus tells us that He bridges the gap between us and God because the distance is too great for us to to uh, bridge that gap on our own. And I'm fond of telling people that Ken Watney bridged the distance between me and Jesus. Uh, he made Jesus uh, uh, palpable for me and then attractive for me uh, as a symbol of, of right-minded thinking, as a symbol of, of someone in the world who tries to practice forgiveness to the best of their ability. Mm -hmm. And uh, without Ken's uh, uh, making it clear to me that the Jesus in the Course in Miracles was not the Jesus of the Bible, um, I probably would not have been able to do that because I, I was very resistant to both God and Jesus when I came to the course. I 
I, I remember the first number of years I used to talk about universal consciousness and that sort of thing that was kind of a new age term back then, rather than speaking about God or Jesus because I wasn't comfortable with it. And again, that's what we're talking about here are these great examples of our personal resistance to this course and to it, you know, getting used to its symbols and then finally accepting them uh, and then finally being able to employ them and use them uh, in, in the way that they're truly helpful. Now, Jesus says that about himself in the course, you know, I, uh, I you know, many a uh, 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 bitter idol has been made of him who would only be brother to the world, who would only try and help you. And of course, that's the Jesus that presents himself to us in the course. It's, it's just an older brother who's exactly like us. He's not special in any way that we're not. He's not specially chosen of God. He's not in any way different than us. He didn't have a virgin birth. Uh, he was, he was a... Uh, came to the earth as a person seemingly in the dream uh, but the difference between he and us was that he knew he was not a body in the world he he had had uh, awakened from the dream what the course calls resurrection he had he had awakened from the dream of death the dream of being a body in the world and he's trying to show us that that we can do the same thing that's that's what this course is all about yeah, it, it, what you're sharing reminds me of the, the importance of um, distinguishing symbol from source, and, and of course makes a point of that. And and you know Jesus being the symbol, and uh, at least <laughs> he's he's trying emphatically to remind us that he's he's more than just a symbol, and and he really is that we all share the same right mind that that he's guiding us back to. And it kind of reminded me of I don't know just a silly uh, a great grade school joke that. Uh, uh, uh <laughs> the little kid was misbehaving and gets gets sent to the head office and and uh you know they they're in the, the head office the the uh the kid is asked you know what's what's wrong why are you misbehaving and so he tells the the chief of the of the, the entire organization it's not the school i mind it's just the principal of the thing so. <laughs> Anyway, but but it's that's kind of like what we do with with uh, the author of this course is like well you know we 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 seem to be taking issue with with the symbol, but it would seem like you know it really it's our resistance to looking at the unconscious unfounded guilt that's behind it that we're all, all fighting off in one way or another. You know, for for those in our audience who are still not aware of their resistance in any real conscious way, you know. Uh, especially for those members of our audience who think that they love this course and that they love Jesus. Uh, I just heard uh, Kenneth Wapik the other day say that, you know, if you loved this course and if you loved Jesus, you wouldn't need this course and you wouldn't need Jesus because you would have already internalized this course, uh, awakened and realized that you are not separate from anyone. And, and so you would have you would have embraced this course and and you wouldn't need it anymore. You would have internalized it. So that's that's another way of becoming aware of our of our resistance. You know, uh, at the conscious level, we do really uh, appreciate this course. But the unconscious part of us, the wrong minded part of us that we keep buried in the unconscious doesn't want anything to do with this course. And of course, it often adopts the strategy of you can't fight them, join them. So, so the ego tries to pretend like it really does like this course and it really does love Jesus. When in fact, it's, it's doing a complete distortion of this course and a complete distortion of what we're being taught in this course by its teacher. Uh, and, um, and so we stay unconscious of our resistance. And that's the ego strategy is to keep us mindless keep us unaware of what we're actually doing. That's that's the key to the resistance. Yeah, yeah, that mindlessness is uh, sometimes <laughs> when I catch myself, it's like, you know, just sort of behaving like a zombie, you know, then, then, I, then it's like the, the momentary is like, oh yeah, that's right. I, I, I couldn't see peace instead of whatever I'm, <laughs> I'm projecting onto it in a given moment. And yeah, uh, yeah it just seems, seems like just noticing um the discomfort is is usually the first step for me of getting back to a more mindful state and 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 um i another thing that i really appreciate uh, ken wapnick's teaching on is is he was talking about freud and and uh talking about the royal road to the unconscious is the dreams and then all our time is spent in dreaming of course says and 
and if I, you know, put those two together, it's like, okay, well, that means that that I just need to look at everything in my world as a projection of, of my my dream of separation, and and that's where you know I get to see the unconscious stuff that I'm not looking at. So all the things in the world, and you know, this this giant horizontal <laughs> merry-go-round of stuff that uh, ev everything from you know nuclear <clears throat> holocaust to, to hangnails and everything in between becomes seems like that becomes the fodder for looking at the unconscious deal doesn't it yes oh yeah and it's what keeps us distracted from from recognizing the problem is in our minds we keep thinking the problem is out there in the world with all of the uh, planet the pollution on the planet and and the wars and uh and the crime in the streets and, and the conflict that you see on the news every night. Uh, you're, you're mentioning Freud, uh, reminds me it's probably a good idea to, to just mention that Freud is the one that put the idea of resistance on, on the uh, radar screen of the world. Mm -hmm. 100 years ago in his work, you know, he was the first one that really realized the power of resistance that's coming out of our unconscious mind. He was analyzing the dream of one of his clients, a, a woman that he'd been working with for a while. And uh, in this woman's dream, she was dreaming that she was trying to prove Freud wrong. And Freud was quite puzzled by that because, because uh, uh, he knew from, from his instructions to her that he was trying to help her uh, uh, get over her neuroses. And why would she be you know, trying to prove him wrong. She was spending a lot of money on this therapy and was working hard to do what he was suggesting. But in her unconscious, she was trying to prove him wrong. Mm -hmm. And in thinking about that, he realized, oh, she didn't really want to get better. And it wasn't just she who did not want to get better. All of his patients were doing that. They were resisting his instructions unconsciously mm -hmm. because they wanted to hang on to their self-concept, which included their neuroses. And, and of course, Jesus picks that theme up in his course and says, yes, that's exactly what's going on. Uh, there's a part of you that does not want to learn this course. You want to stay the separated self that you think you are, that's a body with a personality in the world. And this course is very threatening to that. In fact, there could hardly be anything more threatening to, to our self-concept than this course because it totally undermines this whole idea that I'm this special separate person in the world of separation and points out that I'm dreaming all of that, uh, that that's not the truth at all. So um, the resistance that, that Jesus is talking about in this course is the resistance to, to recognizing that he's right about what's going on and we are wrong. We're wrong uh, starting at, at ground zero, where we believe that we're a body with a personality in the world of separation. So we have a big debt of gratitude to Freud for putting resistance on, on the radar screen, not just for, for uh, uh, patients, but for, for all of us. And certainly all of us as students in, the, in this course have to recognize our resistance to it without fighting with it. Uh, and of course, you can't help but fight with it at the unconscious <laughs> level at first. Yeah. But but bringing that that uh, unconscious uh, unconsciousness about our resistance into the into the awareness of the light of day is how we undo it. And so you don't fight against resistance. Of course, you you look at it with the the teacher of love, the teacher that undoes that resistance but not by trying to pretend that you're not resistant. You look at it and you learn to smile at it and not take it so seriously and go, oh, of course I'm resistant, resistant to what this course is teaching me because what this course is teaching me is that Doug is not who he thinks he is and he's not the separated special person that he wants to be. That that's the problem, the, the I uh, is, is the problem, this identification with being this special self. And, and that's, of course, uh, something that the ego uh, cannot be peaceful with and is greatly uh, disturbed by. So you get to a point where there's no pretending that, that you're resistant after a while because here I am still thinking I'm Doug, so I must still be resistant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the evidence is overwhelming, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's self-evident if you're part of the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that's good. That's really good. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, I was thinking, um, what you shared a moment ago remind me of, you know, one of Ken's comments about, uh, you know, nice people stay in heaven, you know, not that they're people, but uh, <laughs> nice non-dual non awareness is, right? Stay in and then, and then the, the metaphor of, you know, the monster under the bed, you know, that we don't want to look at, which, which is a kind of tantamount, I guess, to the resistance. And, and um, but what, you know, when, when we ask Holy Spirit or Jesus for help, it seems like in the in those moments when we're you know most sanity, uh, you know, he says together we have the light that will dispel the darkness, and so it's sort of like okay let's get that flashlight look under yeah. the bed together because if I look on my own I'm still going to see you know a scary monster but uh, if I look with Jesus or Holy Spirit uh, the Jesus of the course that is uh, it's just going to be dust bunnies and and I've got a little robot vacuum over here that will take care of those so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I just ran it this morning under the bed, so it works pretty good. Yeah. Yes, our, our relationship with this other teacher is the light, you yeah. know, it's, and and that light, as we shine it onto the world, then becomes our relationship with everyone that we know here in the world, uh, 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 both those that we know of on television and by reading books and whatever means we might hear about others in the world, but certainly all of those people that are a personal part of our lives in our ongoing way, the people that we live with, the people that we work with. Uh, it's, it's in working through those relationships and recognizing that, that we want to see our interests as the same in all of those relationships that begins to undo our resistance. You know, the, the sponsor of our resistance, the thing that keeps it going is our judgment of others. Mm -hmm. our, our judgments of others and our condemnations of others is an expression of our resistance to recognizing that we're all a part of the same family. And like any family, we have our, our differences, but that doesn't mean that we're not a family and that we're not the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and by in the same, I mean that we are the same in that we have a, a, a a right mind and a wrong mind and the ability to choose between the two. Everyone has that. And so we're all the same. Uh, we're not the same at the level of form, of course, that's obvious. But as the Course says, those differences at the level of form are differences that don't make a difference. And <laughs> when we make them be a big uh, difference for us, make a difference for us, mm -hmm. that's a part of the resistance. Yeah, yeah. That's huge, isn't it? I mean, because you think of all the different schisms and factions and and polarizations and and uh, we they fragmentations in our culture, you know, between just just the obvious ones like you know, gender and now there's you know multiple permutations of that and then there's there's political and uh, socioeconomic and geographic and cultural and and uh, it just I mean that's just within one species and. <laughs> I mean, in, in thousands of different other ways that, you know, we try to distinguish or differentiate ourselves as, as, as being separate or different. And it doesn't mean that we, you know, stop doing all the normal things, but uh, just just noticing, I find if I, if I notice when I'm doing a we, they thing, it's like, if I can catch myself, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm making, you know, a, a case for um, my lack of peace, basically, when I realize I'm wanting to divide myself and instead of seeing everybody's fighting the same same battle and then there's then there's all the the uh, flora and fauna and and that's just <laughs> and all, all the seemingly inanimate life forms on this planet let alone the rest of the cosmos you know that just on on the level of the space-time dream itself uh, it's a lot a lot of ways we can fragment and and maintain that res that type of resistance just huge categories there uh, Yes, I, I, you point out all those differences that we tend to see and make them into a big deal. And that, that really is the, the classroom of our life, is to notice that we're doing that. And that's the stuff that we want to bring to Jesus, that we want to bring to our right mind, to the Holy Spirit, to, to, to the light of day. That's, that's the darkness that's in our mind, uh, that I think that, that I have a difference with somebody that makes a difference. That's, that's the darkness that I want to bring to the light. And the light shines on that and can show me that, yes, we are different at the level of form. You know, one person's a Republican and another's a Democrat. And we, we think that those, the agendas of the Republicans and the Democrats are, make a big difference. And so we want to recognize that, that it's in, in appreciating another's uh, uh, difference from us 
and and allowing that without attacking it that we find peace uh, and and uh, that's that's where we trip over form in the world because we think that it's that the form of the world is where we're going to find happiness but the only place that we're going to find happiness and peace is in our minds not out in the world and so it's critical how we look at the world that we think is out there which means it's critical to look at it with the, the teacher that will show us that those differences don't make a difference. But the only way we can get to that is by, is by examining our resistance. So we have to admit to ourselves, yes, we are resistant, and that's what we want to bring to our teacher, is look, I, I, don't, want, I don't want to accept that Vladimir Putin is my brother. Uh, I don't want to accept that, that uh, all of those symbols of horror out there in the world are projected there by me who wants to see evil out in the world so that I can look at that, compare myself to it, and think that I'm innocent while still separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and so, innocent by comparison, if there's, as long as there's a comparison and that we make a big deal out of that, that's, that's a clue, isn't it? That, Yes, we're resisting the peace. Yes. Yeah, no, another example that comes to mind that's sort of so I I, I like like how um, sometimes we get in our pop culture examples that that remind us to not take our 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 passionate <laughs> obsession with differences too seriously. In the in the movie The Life of Brian, there's one scene where a Monty Python film where where the Python troop. Uh, it, they're dressed up as the people's front of Judea and they're, and they're in this Roman amphitheater and, and uh, Brian just stumbles across this group and, and he says, are you the people's front of Judea? And they say, well, actually they shut out an expletive, but it's just, no, we're the Judean people's front, you know, like that's a big difference, you know, <laughs> and, but that's what we do, you know, and, and then I realized, well, I do the same thing just on a daily basis, you know, I'll, I'll rearrange the things in the refrigerator or, or the, and that, and when, in a way, sometimes consciously, sometimes mostly unconsciously in a way that annoys my wife or, or, or vice versa, or, you know, all the, all the silly things we do that are just, are just silly. And, and, um, but, but when I don't catch myself doing them, it's like, oh, okay, I must want the battle. I must have picked up the sword. Um, in, in the, there's a section in the manual I just, I just read yesterday with uh, Susan Dugan and we were talking about the, you know, the peace of God. And there's, there's, a, there's a line in there that says, you know, noticing when you've picked up the sword. It's to me, that's like another example of, it's like, oh, if I'm making, you know, this sort of being a great metaphor for dividing and, and you know, fragmenting, <laughs> cutting into pieces. And if I can just remember, it's like every time I am making a big deal out of, of wanting things my way or seeing things, you know, insisting that, or even thinking that someone should think my way, whatever that my way is, it's like I've got I've got that sword in my hand, and like how did that get there? Well, I guess I must have picked it up. <laughs> is the reluctant response of honesty? Yeah. Yes, and that that sword is a double-edged sword, and we can't mm -hmm. wield it against another without wielding it against ourselves at the same time without realizing. You know, we draw it back to hit somebody else over, <laughs> and we slice ourselves open. You know, <laughs> exactly. It, it really is a, yeah. a hard to recognize that that mm -hmm. that my attacks on others are an attack on myself because mm -hmm. the others are a part of myself that I put out there, mm -hmm. just so I could pretend like they weren't myself and could attack them. But, but attack always, you know, that, that cycle of, of guilt, attack, attack, defense goes round and round and round. I feel guilty myself. I try to get rid of that guilt by projecting it onto somebody else. And as soon as I see it, I attack it. But that attack just makes me feel guilty unconsciously because I, I realize that I'm attacking somebody who is a part of myself at the unconscious level. And so I feel badly about doing that. That makes me feel worse, which only compels me to attack more. So I, I attack you, and then I know that I've attacked you, and then I feel defensive about you because I presume that you're going to attack me back. Whether you do or not, I'll think you're going to. And then I feel defensive again. So it's, it's I feel guilty, I try to project it out, I attack you, and then I feel defensive because I think you're going to attack me back. And that just goes round and round and round. That's the news every night, you know, the, the news that begins every evening by saying good evening and then is followed by a half an hour explanation of why it's not a good evening. 
<laughs> pretty much <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i mean it's it's laughable and yet we all do it and i think that's why there's so much emphasis also in the course of you know persistence but patient patience in the course and and that it's not it's not just a weekend workshop kind of a thing where it's like oh i i learned to forgive now i'm good you know it's like well no i've there's still more of that that submerged part of the iceberg i still need to look on the unconscious mind yeah. and you bring up a you bring up a topic there that's very important but the name of the game with this course is practice 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 i mean and and do it lightheartedly as, as lightheartedly as we can and we want to be as lighthearted as we as we can realizing that there's sometimes when we're very serious uh, if if some situation in our life is far enough up our hierarchy of illusions that really frightens us you know we're probably not going to be able to be lighthearted about it and there's no need to fight with ourselves in that regard either when when we're serious and we're taking some situation in our lives our personal health the health of our loved ones someone dying that we care about some situ situation in the world that truly frightens us, you know, there's no need to pretend to be lighthearted. We, we want to admit to ourselves, I'm frightened right now. In fact, what I'm really frightened about is not the situation in the world, it's, it's I'm frightened of love. And, and it doesn't seem like that when I'm, when I'm frightened about, let's just say I get a bad report from the doctor. It doesn't seem like that I'm afraid of love. It seems like the report from the doctor is frightening me. But, but uh, if, if I weren't afraid of love, the loving way of looking at that would, would dissolve the fear. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, you, want, you want to just admit to ourselves, we, we all want to be able to admit to ourselves that I'm just too frightened of love right now to not, to not to embrace that. And so I'm just afraid, but at least then I'm being honest. I'm choosing fear and, and I'm too afraid right now to choose love instead. And that's that's all you have to do. You don't have to undo it, but that that involves being willing to stay with the discomfort, the pain, uh, the anger, whatever it is, uh, while while owning it and not blaming it on something outside. And so, that of course involves being willing to look at my my desire to then project it again and go, well, the reason I'm upset is because of the doctor's report. It's, uh, it's my health that's scaring me. But as we know from lesson five, I'm never upset for the reason I think. The only reason I'm ever upset is because I chose the wrong teacher. I chose the teacher of fear instead of the teacher of peace. So I have to keep bringing my fear back to that, to that fifth lesson in the, in the workbook. I'm never upset for the reason I think. Yeah, that's, that's so much so much uh, resistance <laughs> in not not looking at that isn't there I, I i really appreciate your sharing the idea that the hierarchy of illusions which of course is is really the egos you know um you know gold one of the the gold standard ideas i guess of the ego of, of like well as long as there's a hierarchy i can defend you know well i'll let some of these you know trivial things pass and i can i can you know deal with those but the things that are my sacred cows or you know enshrined um you know bastions of fear i i, I you know sorry can't let any course ideas in there <laughs> and uh you know the irony of course is that that uh you know the very first miracle principle you know there's no order of difficulty among them suggests that any hierarchy we make whether it's illusions or or otherwise is is made up and and therefore forgivable but i but it, we all need to like you say you know work with where we're what we're capable in that moment of, of allowing ourselves to to look at and uh, be, and yes. be patient with ourselves yeah yes uh, um, the first first miracle principle stands in juxtaposition to the first law of chaos which mm -hmm. is that there is a hierarchy of illusions as you well know mm -hmm. you know those two those two things are are uh, uh, a way of seeing the, the difference between truth and illusions. Illusions are based on this idea that there is a hierarchy of illusions, that, that obviously uh, a hangnail is not as serious as cancer, you know, and, and then here comes Marty Pants Jesus and tells us that, no, that's not true. There is no order of difficulty. Uh, that when your mind is healed, you will be no more frightened by cancer than you'll be frightened by a hangnail. 
they are the, they're the same thing. There's, you're thinking that there's some problem with the body in the world. And that's what's distracting you from recognizing the truth that you're not a body and you're perfectly safe, whatever's going on with your body. Uh, but since, since I want to stay identified as a body, I'm resistant to that. I'm resistant, resistant to accepting that idea. And that's, of course, uh, what's going on with whatever I'm resistant to. I, I like my illusions and I don't want to let go of them because the truth threatens them. And the, the truth then is what I'm afraid of, uh, ironically. That's, that's pretty bizarre, isn't it? When you think about it that way, <laughs> that, that we're, we're terrified of, of our real identity and, and everyone else's real identity, which is the same. When, when you, you, you reminded me that, that, that you know, juxtaposition of the, the first miracle principle that, that uh, there's no order difficulty in miracles in, in stark contrast to the ego's first law of chaos that you know the truth is different for everyone i was thinking well the only way differences can be real is in duality and duality is is synonymous with sin or separation or substitution or specialness all those kind of anything that implies i like those three together uh, separation specialness and um, and substitution my, my three three go-to words for taking the word sin and kind of applying it uh, to everyday stuff it's like if i can remember it's like if i'm thinking in dualistic terms i'm making a difference real and i'm, I'm establishing a hierarchy in my dream that i want to defend and and that seems like that covers a huge range or realm of ways that i can resist the peace which is crazy when i put it that way but i'm that's evidently what i'm doing is resisting peace there's a reason Jesus speaks to us as uh, as being insane, mm -hmm. you know, because we are. Um, you know, while while we're on this subject, you know, it's probably well worth bringing up here for for everybody that's listening to this talk that one of the things that we need to recognize as core students is that we're attracted to our own suffering. You know, we like being victimized. We like being mistreated. Not not at the conscious level. Not as the person that you think you are as in the world. You don't want to be in pain. That that person that you think that you are at the conscious level does not want to be in pain. But there's an unconscious part of all of us that does want to be in pain because that proves that we're a body and not a mind. Uh, and we think that that pain is coming from the body and not from the mind. But that's, that's not true. Uh, since there is no body, since there is no world, you know, lesson, lesson 132, I loose the world from all I thought it was repeats that over and over again, like six or seven times in the very same lesson that, that uh, uh, you know, I, that the world is an illusion, the world is, in a, dream, is a dream. And, and uh, we, we do not want to, to believe that. We're very resistant to believing that. And the way that we hang on to that resistance is by hanging on to pain, hanging on to suffering, hanging on to our stories of mistreatment whether it was yesterday uh, or the day before or 60 years ago, we just treasure all of these stories and tell them over and over and over again to anyone who will listen about how we were mistreated and how we are still being mistreated. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing any of us who do that. We, we're all uh, hanging on to this, this, this feeling of being mistreated, but it's not for the reason that we think. Uh, we're attracted to all of that because it keeps us separate and it keeps us being us, but seeming to not be responsible for being separate, which of course is the ego's twofold wish. I, I want to be a separate individual and be special, but I don't want to be responsible for the suffering that it brings to me. I want that to be somebody else's fault. Mm -hmm. So it starts with my parents and then it's my siblings and then it's my peers and then it's my, you know, uh, my government you know we, we're good at diversifying aren't we yes those other drivers <laughs> out there on the freeway yeah, yeah you know yeah. it's not my fault mm -hmm. and that becomes our, our mantra as we go through this world and that's how we stay separate is by going i'm innocent and the world is guilty of mistreating me yeah and that that needs to be made conscious we need to become aware of the fact that we're doing that because we can't we can't help our teacher uh, help us undo it if we don't own it. 
So staying in denial about wanting to suffer is one of the ways that we keep right on suffering. We keep claiming that it's not our fault. Uh, and of course, we have to be responsible for that. That's, that's what honesty in the Course in Miracles means. You know, I have to, I have to, be, to be honest means that I have to be completely self-responsible for everything that I feel, for everything that I think, for everything that I say, and for everything that I do. Uh, if I don't do that, I'm not being responsible. As long as I'm blaming anybody else for my feelings about anything, I'm, I'm deceiving myself and I'm staying resistant. That covers a lot of ground. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speak, speaking of I covering go on and on sometimes, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, no, that's, that's super important points. And and you're mentioning, you know, the the uh, some you know the idea of you know drivers on the road. Uh, last night I happened to watch a, a re replay of a Nova, a PVS special on. Um, driverless cars that you know, are using you know artificial intelligence and lidar and all these fancy technologies to detect pedestrians and other cars and and the foibles and and the the you know the, the challenges they're having of making making that all work because it's you know not a simple problem to solve all those the very you know seemingly infinite variables so kind of kind of reminds me of the, the section in the manual it, uh, talks about you know judgment in order to judge anything rightly or to to avoid <laughs> traffic <laughs> mishaps we, we would have to be aware of a, a completely you know enormous range of things past present and to come you know and that's that's kind of what these driverless cars are assuming sort of trying to assume godlike prescience of, of figuring out okay well how can i avoid any possible mishap on the road you know without having a human involved and uh, what a great example of a further projection. So now we have grievances against people, but now we have grievances against organizations pop peopled by those who are trying to make technology and, and we're grievances against the technology that then part become part of our resistance. Anyway, it just goes on and on, doesn't it? It's just, it's staggering when, when you think of all the different ways that, you know, if we, if we seem like we, we look at one grievance and then it's sort of like a bubble under the wallpaper kind of resurfaces over there. So we maybe we really haven't done the equivalent of the hypodermic needle and pull the bubble out of the wall <laughs> altogether. <laughs> yeah. And as you point out, you know, the, the problems in the world are very complicated, you mm -hmm. know, they're, they're endlessly complicated mm -hmm. by our own design. You mm -hmm. know, trying to make the world work mm -hmm. is, is uh, you know, uh, try, trying to empty Pandora's box, you know, or cut through the Gordian knot of, of the world. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we custom designed the world so that it can't be fixed. And yet we, we are, are fixated on trying to fix the world. And that's how we keep ourselves distracted, you know, among other things, from our resistance to, to letting go of the world. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was also flashing on it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting kind of silly, I suppose, but there's this uh, wonderful uh, cartoonist named Dan Perara who does this comic strip called Bizarro. And I had a book of his cartoons a while back and on the cover of it, it shows this new new uh, entry into hell. And uh, he's, he's taking a look around his, his new surroundings and the devil's standing next to him there. And, and uh, you know, the flames are leaping up and these devils got the pitchfork and all the cliches. And, and um, this new new arrival in hell says, "Wow, I didn't know there'd be TV here," and uh, and the devil says, "There's nothing but television here." <laughs> 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 but but it's sort of like you know, it's the sort of the special love set up for the special hate kind of thing, you know. And oh. it's like, okay, well now now we think, oh, I fixed this part of the dream, you know, and then and then we realize no, that the the solution is worse than than the problem, you know, a lot of times. <laughs> But uh, anyway, that just struck me funny. I'm thinking about that, and uh, but uh, you know all the different ways that we we think we'll just throw more money or technology or whatever at the problem, but we we keep trying to solve it with the ego instead of Holy Spirit, and and you know all those wonderful attempts you know knock ourselves out, but but they're all ultimately doomed, I suppose, right? Yeah. Yes. Nothing but television. That that would be hell, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I worked in that industry for a couple of decades, so that was particularly poignantly funny for me. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and I say that as somebody who 
uh, spends his fair amount of time in front of the idiot box. So, yeah. <laughs> Same here. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. The things we do for entertainment, huh? Yes. But, uh, yes yeah. For distraction, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, distraction is another whole category of resistance, isn't it? I mean, oh, yes. uh, I was noticing that today. I, I thought, well, I could, I could, you know, really, you know, read a little bit more of Ken's comments on resistance. And I was, well, but I've got this, this little um, doorstop in the hall I should fix, you know, before my wife gets home. <laughs> so I was doing that, but which I'm glad I did. But it's like Get I was points. trying to Get those points. Yeah, I, exactly. And I was just kind of noticing. It's like you know, why do I do anything, you know, and what, if I can just, you know, gently laugh at myself when I catch myself either avoiding or procrastinating or, you know, doing all those silly things that, uh, that are really ways to um, intensify the shame or, or guilt or, you know, self-blame, whether it's seemingly projected out onto someone else or not. Huh? Yeah, just don't, the, the variation is, seems to endless. Oh, yes. Uh, you're mentioning the world as a distraction device. You know that's that. But we made the world so that we would have a place to hang out while we hang on to our resistance. I um, mean, we made the world so that we could point an accusing finger at it and say, "It's the problem. I'm not the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not my mind that's doing this. It's the world out there, the physical phenomenal universe that's doing it to me." And that's that's the key to to resistance is is staying preoccupied with with the belief that the world is the cause of my upset. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's where our resistance is always showing up in one form or another. We're, we're trying to retrench and retrench and retrench again and again uh, in some way that, that points an accusing finger at the world so that I don't have to be responsible. Because as you were alluding to earlier, the, the, the ego teaches us that it's one or the other. Either you're the sinner or I'm the sinner, but we can't both, we, we have to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to be innocent, I have to make you guilty. And if you're going to be innocent, you have to make me guilty. And that's what makes the world go round. Uh, you watch, watch TV at night in the news and all of the governments are doing that. The Russians are saying it's our fault, we're saying it's the Russians' fault. You know, uh, and, and every country is doing that with somebody. And of course, every person is doing that with somebody. So it's the same thing. It's just the, the, the countries no. are doing what egos are doing. And so- Yeah, as you're saying that, I was thinking, think is, it, oh. Go ahead. I, I, I wanted to hear the last of the thought guys started, you know, with that. Uh, oh, I was just the, that, that governments are doing what individuals are doing. It's just on a broader yeah. scale, that's all. It's, yeah. it's our- wanting to blame somebody else that gets reflected in our country wanting to blame some other country and that's the game that politicians play you know it's a game that democrats and republicans play the republicans blame the democrats the democrats blame the republicans and now it's gotten into a food fight you know it's they're not even polite with each other anymore you know there was a certain uh, amount of decorum you know, the honorable gentleman from Alabama, rep, you know, recognizes the honorable gentleman from New York. Uh, but now, you know, this is, uh, it's, they're, they're barely able to be polite to one another. It's gotten to such a point of blame and nobody recognizes the, the problem is the blame itself, not, mm. not who's being blamed by whom. Yeah, I, I was thinking sort of like, no matter how far you zoom in or out, the ego's this thought system is insane. And, uh, you know, it's like a fractal. Um, there, there's an image called the Mandelbrot set that you can zoom in and out. And, and after a while, it starts repeating, no matter how far you zoom in or out, it starts looking the same again, because it because it is all the same. And, uh, and it's that sameness that the ego doesn't want us to recognize. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It wants us lost in the hierarchy of minutia. Yeah, yeah, and it, mindless. Every problem is separate and it requires a separate solution. You know, and the course just boils that all down to it's one problem and it's one solution. Your your one problem is that you're you're choosing the wrong teacher. And the one solution is to choose the right teacher for how you look at each thing. Mm -hmm. And you look at each separate thing with that right teacher until you begin to see that, oh, they are all the same. I'm zooming out and zooming out and zooming out, and it's still the same problem. 
you know, and, and the problem is the belief that my interest is separate from yours, that my interest is separate from anyone else's. Uh, and, and until I'm willing to, to cop to that, that I'm, that I'm making the mistake of making our interests separate and thinking that I'm right and somebody else is wrong, until I stop that, until I take, take charge of that, until I start saying to myself, it's not all right to judge, it's not all right to attack, it's not all right to gossip, it's not all right to criticize, it's not all right to bicker. Until I start owning that, the world isn't going to change for me at all. Mm -hmm. And so it's up to me to change my mind about the world. That's that's the key to the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, very excellent point. And it, it's always up to us. And it doesn't it seem like the um, the one way to get to that that I, I find helpful is I just notice how I'm, if I can remember to notice how I'm feeling and to connect with how I'm feeling with what what thought system I'm choosing. And if I'm not at peace, it's like, oh, I must have chosen the wrong teacher again <laughs> and just keep coming back to that. And like, a, you know, this little tight loop of, of a decision making flow chart kind of thing and just saying, OK, if I'm if I'm not at peace, I must have chosen wrongly. And and then I can jump out of that loop and choose the teacher kindness in my mind. And and, uh, and that remembering that it's in my mind is, is, is such an important thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes, that point that you just made is enumerated in the very last paragraph of the Laws of Chaos in chapter 23, where Jesus says to us, if you want to know whether you've chosen the stairway to heaven or the, the descent into hell, ask yourself, how do I feel? Yeah. Do I feel at peace? Do, is everyone that I think of included in that peace? Uh, if not, I'm headed, headed into the basement. And, and if everyone is included, I'm climbing back up the, the staircase that the ego led me down. I'm getting myself out of this mess. Uh, but uh, I, yeah, I, have to be, I have to be paying attention to my reaction to everything. And if it's anything less than completely peaceful, guess who's running the show? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> it's, as you say that, I was thinking, how, how often do I forget that, you know, I'm just, you know, pretend I'm, clueless which in, for all intents and purposes in those moments i am when i when i you know think that somehow the world is is doing something to me instead of it's like oh i'm doing this to myself that's right you yeah. know yeah i just yeah. watched myself do that yesterday a, a neighbor of ours had their catalytic converter stolen off of their car in the middle uh, of the night and, and i've heard they heard the bash of those people yeah. st stealing it off of my cars you know uh -huh. and it's in a very expensive fix and it's not always covered by insurance you know and i found myself uh cogitating about how to protect myself from that and and what i would do to somebody if i caught them doing that and, and just going completely insane over this this projected thought about about uh being unfairly treated again by some some villain out there that's going to abuse me um, and I spun on that for a half an hour before I even noticed I was doing it. You know, it was just had gone gone crazy and hadn't noticed it. Mm -hmm. And this is this is a neighbor's car, not your own, right? Yeah. Yes. This yeah. Yeah. A, yeah. Right. Which which actually is kind of reminds me of a favorite Mark Twain quote. Yeah, uh, I think it's something like, uh, "There's been a lot of tragedy in my life, and some of it actually happened." <laughs> and yeah. I think the courses version was well. None of it really happened, but we're working up to that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll consider that tomorrow. <laughs> That's another interesting strategy of the ego. You know, I, I, I know that I'm, I'm still making mistakes, but I'll work on that tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll do that later. Right, right now, I'm, I'm, I've got a party to go to. I want patience, and I want it now. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing all the different ways we procrastinate. Uh, oh, some, yeah. Something you said a moment ago reminded me of something that you shared in one of your Wednesday morning classes, which are wonderful, by the way. A little quick plug for uh, your online Zoom classes on Wednesday mornings. Um, you had said that, the, and I, th I think it was in relating to a comment that Ken Wapnick made, but I never really quite equated the, the, the two uh, as the same as uh, um, the same real root problem as, as and I think the way you shared it was something that Ken said was 
um, the problem isn't the ego because that's that's a made up uh, identity uh, and the, the problem is really our believing in the ego or or equivalent statement to that would be our wanting the ego and it seems like those are both two sides of the same resistance aren't they yes yes it's the problem isn't the ego how can nothing be a problem how can mm -hmm. something that does not exist be a problem mm -hmm. and the ego isn't an entity it's a thought system based on the belief in the reality of separation and therefore separate interests mm -hmm. But the ego is not the problem. The ego doesn't exist. It's our being attracted to it, our choosing it as our thought system and therefore making it real for us. That's the problem. So, so I'm always my own problem because I'm always the one choosing my ego to look at things with, my belief in separation and separate interest to filter things through rather than seeing that, that our interests are the same. That, that the person that's stealing the catalytic converter and the person that being stolen from are, are opposite sides of the, of the same oneness. And that, that failure to recognize their interests as the same is what causes us to get upset. Um, I think of that story of the intruder in, in Ken Wabick's apartment one night. Uh, Ken woke up and realized there was a, a person oh, in his apartment in the middle of the night. And, and as soon as he realized that and collected him himself, he, you know, he spoke to the person and he said, how can I help you? You know, uh, and, and the person was so taken aback, they, they very quickly became defenseless because of his defenselessness, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't attack them. Uh, they, he said the man kept a hand in his jacket like he might have had a gun or a knife or something, but that, that uh, Ken, Ken got up and, and uh, you know, gave him what money he had in his wallet. And then, then because it was in an apartment building, the guy had come in off the fire escape uh, uh, because he, was, he gave him all the money out of his wallet. And the guy was so taken aback that he gave some of the money back to Ken and said, here, I don't want to leave you with no money. And then Ken said, well, uh, let me put on my robe and my slippers and I'll take you down and let you out the front door because there's a uh, person there in the lobby that watches the door. So he went down and laid him outside like he was a friend of his and said good night. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for changing the nature of a relationship yeah, right. on the fly, huh? Yeah, from from fear it. from fear to love. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Wonderful story. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, if we could just remember to be that that uh, mindful uh, at every moment, and, and it seems like we're we're working up to that. You know, I think that's. That's something that is inevitably what we'll want to choose to have that um, feeling of kinship and connectedness and uh, um, lack of willing to condemn uh, if that's if that's the way to phrase it. I was also thinking about the word lack too is is you know the the idea of lack really is um, you know we we think that we lack this or that in the world but it's really as you were talking about earlier that we, we don't think there's enough innocence to go around i mean at least that's sort of the ego's premise isn't it that uh, you know we think that well if i there's only enough innocence for me i everyone else has to be guilty then <laughs> I, I gotta 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 keep keep the guilt uh, game going and yeah. that's that's the scarcity principle that the course talks about of course yeah. is that is that there's not enough yeah and and of course, we custom design the world to appear that way on purpose, uh, so that we could, could could be distracted again from from our own minds by thinking that the, the solution is out there in the world. There are limited resources, so I've got to go get mine. And if it has to be at your expense, I'm sorry, but uh, me first. Mm -hmm. you know? And and that's that's what makes the world go around again is that that we're all competing for what are obviously limited resources at the level of form, but there are no limited resources at the level of the mind, uh, and at, it's at the level of the wrong mind there are very limited resources, but at the, well, at, in the right mind there are unlimited re resources, and the way that we get love is by giving it away, so. In loving another, I experience love. In giving it away continuously, I experience it continuously. In being kind all the time, I experience kindness as if I did that. But when I do remember to do that, that's <laughs> yeah. how I experience it. 
Uh, yeah. and, and each time I do that, it reinforces for me, oh, yes, I do want to be kind because that's when I, I feel all right. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to be loving that because that's when I do feel at peace. Yeah. And when I'm judging and attacking and defending, I don't feel any of that. I feel all uptight and nervous and fearful and angry yeah. and uncomfortable and in pain. And, mm -hmm. and I'm doing that to myself. You know, that's the secret of salvation, you know. On page 578, the very bottom of the page, you know, uh, the secret of salvation is I'm doing this to myself. When I'm in pain, when I'm uncomfortable, when I'm upset, I'm doing that to myself. It's not coming from outside of me. It's coming from me, doing it to me by judging and attacking instead of forgiving and letting go. Or it's, it's a choice, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. It's I, an ongoing choice, moment yeah. by moment by moment. Yeah. yeah. Years ago, I, I had this phrase come into my mind when I was, I think it was in either late high school, early college days, uh, even before the course was, was published. And, and it was just like, okay, I'm choosing to feel this way. And I thought, well, that's, that's, that's good. I, I, I like that. So I, I took a piece of computer paper that was about six, seven feet long, and I wrote that in big black block letters. I am choosing to feel this way. I'm pointing, I'm pointing up because I, I tacked it up right below the ceiling where I, in, in uh, my bedroom, I uh, still living with my folks um, <laughs> in the college area kind of thing. And, and uh, I found that, that um, when I was having a, a, what I considered a good day, I would look at that and say, yes, I'm choosing to feel this way. Um, but then I really I quickly realized that kind of like the courses metaphysics is, is it's not about, you know, you know, um, affirming happiness. It's basically looking at where I'm denying it. And, and to our topic of resistance, it's like, I noticed that when it was really effective and where it really got some traction was when I was having a day that was not going the way that this character, Bruce, wanted it to go. And I would, with gritted teeth and clenched fists, have to admit that as I read that, I am still choosing to feel this way. <laughs> And you that's resistant to that, were you? What's that? You weren't resistant to that oh, idea, were you? Oh no, not at all. <laughs> just a smidge. Just a smidge. No, but yeah, but that was that was when I first started to realize it's like, oh man, I I you know, I could maybe see peace instead of it. But it, but it's a slow process, isn't it? And just you know, to yeah. be really patient with ourselves. Yeah. Practice, practice, practice. For sure, for sure. Well, it looks like we've we've been talking for just about an hour, I guess, give or take. And uh, uh, anyway, I want to thank you so much, Doug, and for for sharing this hour with with uh, with me and with whoever happens to listen to this. And um, anyway, you can you can find uh, Doug online at dougsparks.aciandblog.com, and also contact him through there if you're interested in his. Uh, uh, Wednesday Zoom class, Wednesday morning Zoom class. Uh, and it, I highly recommend it for anybody who's interested and has uh, an affinity for uh, what we've been talking about, Ken Wapnick's work and and uh, all those I wonderful ideas. So um, in, anything else you'd want, want to share? Doug? Just to say that it's a completely self-selecting course. You don't have to go through me. Just uh, <laughs> I'll be glad to send you the information and you can try it out and if you like it, you're welcome to hang out with us every week. And if it's not your cup of tea, no one will be insulted. So uh, that's how that works. That's great. And Bruce, so. it's a pleasure to spend time with you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, and, likewise. Uh, very much. Very, very much. Share ideas with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks again. Yes. So.